Hey guys, it's Sarah and welcome back to my YouTube channel and happy holidays to all of you wherever you may be. So as some of you know, I've lived in both the US and China. I've experienced the holiday seasons on both sides. I've seen where they're wildly different and where there are similarities. So I thought it would be fun to break down for you today how rich Chinese do American holidays. And you won't believe what they do for Christmas, but more on that later. So what I'm gonna do today is I'm gonna go over Thanksgiving, Christmas, Valentine's Day, and Halloween. Do you know any other cultures that experience American holidays in crazy ways? Tell me in the comments below because I wanna know. Thanksgiving. So next year, 2021, will actually be the 400th anniversary of Thanksgiving. It began from the English colonists that we call pilgrims who went to colonize New England and they survived the brutal winter only because the Native Americans were kind enough to take care of them. So for Thanksgiving today, everybody gets time off of work. People travel long distances, even during COVID times, to go see their family. And it's all about prayer, and food. Meanwhile, in China, it's only celebrated by the very young and the very rich, and you have to be both young and rich, um, and here's why. Rich Chinese are the only ones who can really afford to study abroad in the holy mecca of education that is America. And Chinese only started rich, mainland Chinese only started getting rich in the mid 2000s. So the first batch of overseas students that we call in Chinese Hai Gui, Hai means ocean, Gui means turtle, so sea turtles is the name we give to overseas students that come back. They started coming back sort of around 2009-2010 and uh, they brought Thanksgiving back with them. So these mainland Chinese kids that went overseas to America to study when November 26th or you know the last Thursday of November came around, bam, here was this holiday they'd never heard of before that seemed like a huge deal um, and they were left with nowhere to go and nobody to spend it with and had to make do. Okay, so what are the differences? One, in China, we spend it with friends instead of family. When I went over to the States to study when I was 14 to go to boarding school at Phillips Exeter, yes, I had to plug my high school. I didn't have direct family there, but I did have some, you know, distant relatives, but I was really lucky to make some really good American friends uh, who took me home with them for Thanksgiving so that I got the full on Thanksgiving experience, which is, you know, tons of food, turkey stuffing, gravy, movie night, football. Basically every time whenever Thanksgiving came around, I would gain like five pounds in three days. Now Chinese kids that didn't have an American family or friends to take them home for Thanksgiving would basically go to Boston or New York and have hot pot with other Chinese students in Chinatown. So after graduating and coming back to China, our parents who have no clue about Thanksgiving obviously have zero interest in celebrating Thanksgiving with us. But because we've spent, you know, a number of years doing this in America, we essentially go find our other Chinese friends that have studied abroad who are also from other affluent families and spend it together. And now in China, because everything kind of catches on, you know, everybody likes an excuse to celebrate some festival. So now in China, you see a lot of people that haven't even studied abroad, but who kind of really like this international twist. They are also starting to celebrate Thanksgiving. So here in China, we basically give thanks to our friends, um, our lover, and also our Chinese social media followers. Yes, it's gone pretty gushy over here. Two, we don't cook. Thanksgiving to Americans is all about cooking at home, starting at lunch, eating through dinner. But in China, we have no idea how to make a turkey stuffing, cranberry sauce. So what happened? Immediately, all the five-star luxury hotels came up with a turkey delivery service. Take your pick, Mandarin Oriental, St. Regis, or Four Seasons. It's also not that common to entertain at home, especially for large groups. So usually, rich Chinese will book some super expensive restaurant or hotel, and we will eat outside. I guess that's also why I can say the only restaurants that are open in America during Thanksgiving are Chinese restaurants. Three, we don't like turkey. In the West, the food is the same every year. Turkey, stuffing, cranberry sauce, mashed potato, pumpkin pie. Now you'll be hard pressed to find an Asian that actually likes white meat. We prefer dark meat and the juicier the better. That's why at Chinese restaurants, chicken thigh is more expensive than chicken breast. And so we don't actually like turkey. It's way too dry. Mm. Turkey takes eight mm. hours to cook. It's easy mm. to mess up. The only two decent pieces worth eating are the two drumsticks, which nobody wants to go for because we don't want to appear greedy. So all you're left with is a bunch of white dry meat that you have to put an enormous amount of stuffing and sauce on just to make it edible. 
our signature dish is Peking duck. And I know to most of you Americans watching, um, when you think of Peking duck, you think of all those ducks hanging in the window of a restaurant and it looks really creepy. But I can tell you Peking duck is just delicious. It's juicy and crispy. So what do we do? Hello, Peking turkey. So bring it on, battle of the birds, turkey versus duck. Tell me in the comments below, what do you prefer? I'm sure once you've tried Peking duck, you can never go back. And Americans, I think even you have to admit, there's a reason you only eat turkey once a year. Anyway, back to Peking turkey, local innovative chefs thought of this in recent years. It's basically, you know, pancake, the thin pancake wrap, hoisin sauce, spring onion, the cucumber, you wrap it up. All we did was switch the bird. Instead of Peking duck, it's Peking turkey. So my Thanksgiving this year was particularly memorable. Why? Because my host, Andy, who is Shanghainese, he's young. He studied a short course at Harvard Business School, my alma mater. He hosted a big Thanksgiving dinner at a super expensive restaurant for like 50, 60 people, complete with a Peking turkey that had fireworks coming out of it. It was on fire. So excited. This is totally localized Thanksgiving dinner, uh, a Chinese style Thanksgiving dinner with like 30 friends over here and um, at a super expensive restaurant in Pudong, Shanghai. And uh, turkey, it's a special kind of turkey. It's like a Peking turkey. That's right, fireworks. And I even kept a little video of it where he actually, there's, there's five stuff that are rolling out the turkey and he's saying, First of all, he says, don't worry, everybody. This turkey is not an American turkey. It is a Chinese done turkey. That's why it'll taste good. And then he goes, stuff, where are the fireworks? The fireworks, they should be coming out of the turkey. Put them in now, I want this on fire. And apart from the turkey, which was kind of the piece de la resistance um, that nobody really ate because I got a piece of turkey breast. Apart from that, it was a 10 course Chinese gastronomy meal. It was amazing. Four, instead of a quiet time, it's actually time to show off. Thanksgiving is known as one of the biggest movie nights in America. You have dinner with family at home and then you go watch a movie and then you go back home. At my friend Andy's Thanksgiving dinner here in Shanghai, every guest received all these personalized Instagrammable gifts including these delicious candies that are matcha candies from this 150 year old Japanese matcha brand. He also invited a master painter that he's currently studying under to put up this big blank canvas. And then each of us had to go around doing self introductions after which we would each paint a brush stroke onto this canvas, which then became collectively one big painting to signify togetherness. Santa's real workshop is not in the North Pole, but actually in a small city called Yiwu, right here in China that's only a short one hour train ride from where I'm sitting now, Shanghai. Inside this Christmas village of Yiwu, there's no snow, there's no elves, but there are 600 factories that produce 60% of the world's Christmas decorations. You heard me right. Not entirely a surprise, given that 80% of the toys that are gifted in the United States are manufactured in China. So as you can see, China is already very connected to what is a very Western holiday. Now let's see how the rich Chinese celebrate it differently or similarly. FYI, Christmas holds a special place in my heart because I grew up in Hong Kong, which at the time was still a British colony before it was handed back over to China in 1997. So we celebrated Chinese and Western holidays. And at home, my mom would throw this annual Christmas party with like 30, 40 friends in our house. And it was amazing. And given my dad studied in the UK, he was all about Christmas gifts under the tree. And in fact, we would open them on Boxing Day whenever we woke up in the morning. So, you know, we maintain some traditional elements. And along with other Chinese students that study abroad in the West, we all got caught up with the magic of Christmas and brought a little bit of it back. There's something magical about being American during the holidays. Holiday songs are playing all the time. Love actually is playing the whole month. It's a spirit of giving, snow, Christmas trees, holiday parties. The entire month is such a fun time of the year 
that all the mainland Chinese students who went over like, oh, this is so cool. It really lightens up what's otherwise a really kind of dark winter. How can we bring this back and have it over here too? So the main differences, here we go. One, Christmas is entertainment, not religious. In America or the West, Christmas is a religious holiday. It's about the baby in the manger. We go to midnight mass. It's time to celebrate with family and the culmination of the year. It's a joyful celebration that runs into New Year's and it's basically the biggest vacation for the West. Now in China, it's not even a holiday. We work through December 25th like a routine day. And that is because we're not Christian. Uh, very few people in China are Christian and Christianity is highly controlled by the government. Christmas for us is entertainment, more like Valentine's Day or Carnival. That is a lighthearted day for going out and seeing friends, as opposed to spending time at home with family. Number two, gifts. Chinese New Year usually falls within five weeks of Christmas, making Christmas this kind of warm up round for the all important family oriented holiday. And in fact, Christmas Eve is the biggest offline, okay, not online, is the biggest offline in-store shopping day of the year. Kind of like Black Friday after Thanksgiving in America. So in the West, it's about giving gifts. In China, it's about buying something nice for yourself. I love myself. Or asking your lover to buy you something nice. That's the China way. There isn't really a concept of gifts under the tree when you wake up the next morning. So what sort of Christmas gifts have we seen amongst the rich and famous in China? Well, in 2018, singer Jay Cho's wife, Hannah, bought him a 430,000 US dollar Lamborghini and then plastered it all over Chinese social media, Weibo. And in 2017, Richard Liu, Liu Qiangdong, who's the boss of JD, which is one of the biggest e-commerce sites over here, he put his then 25-year-old wife, yes, yeah, she's 24 years old, younger than him, as the launch screen of their app. Could there be a bigger Christmas gift than that? Oh, and once on her birthday, he sent her 13,000 US dollars worth of red roses in the shape of a teddy bear in 2018. Third difference, more Santas. The Santas in the USA are all big and jolly. And the mecca of Santas is probably the Macy Santa, who is all those things, jolly fat and with a perfectly groomed beard. For those of you that haven't seen my YouTube video on how to groom your beard perfectly by Joe Barella, I'm doing a plug for that now, go watch it. So anyway, in America, they all have these cute little elves in Santa workshop type setups. And in pre-COVID times, Americans would put their kids on Santa's lap where they would ask for stuff and then they would receive a gift. Here in China, forget all about that. Over here, it's about Santa playing the saxophone and his sexy Santa sisters. There is no concept of Jesus, just Santa Claus. And the retail sector in China has really capitalized on this, decorating shopping malls with promo events, big sales discounts, huge trees, Santas. But more importantly, the Chinese version, Chinese rendition of Santa and his helper elves. That's right, for whatever reason over here, Santa Claus, who's known as Sheng Dan Lao Ren, uh, old Santa, is seen as playing the saxophone. It's not entirely known why he's playing the saxophone in China. I personally think it's probably because Santa's seen as this very Western thing and uh, saxophone is seen as this very Western thing. So they just kind of compile the two Western things. And instead of elves, it's these scantily clad Santa sisters uh, that are usually models from up north in Beijing because northern girls are considered taller. But you know, young women dressed up as part of an event is a pretty common sighting in China. They do a lot of that with like PR stuff. But anyway, this commercialized version of Santa is what Chinese are most familiar with. Therefore, when rich Chinese moms hold Christmas parties for their kids, they also hire a Santa playing a saxophone. And they're not that skinny. I think it's hard to find a jolly fat Santa over here. Four. Rich Chinese go to Finland's North Pole. In the West, the North Pole is this mystical, magical place where Santa makes his toys and spends most of his year. But for rich Chinese, it is the ultimate destination. If you can afford to go to the North Pole, you've made it because it is the ultimate rich person winter destination. Why? Chinese President Xi Jinping visited Santa Claus in Rovaniemi, Finland, when he was serving as vice president of China back in 2010. When touring Santa's village, you can actually see the photo of Xi Jinping sitting with Santa Claus firsthand. After it was made public that Xi had visited Santa Claus, droves of rich Chinese 
would go to Finland's North Pole during Christmas time. So it seems that Xi Jinping himself doesn't mind a bit of Christmas either. You know, it's funny because the North Pole is not a place where Westerners would ever think of visiting. It's really kind of the place that you write letters to when you're a little kid. But I have to say, after looking at photos of it, it's really beautiful. There's reindeer, there's sleigh, there's beautiful snow. And I'm proud to say Xi Jinping is the ultimate influencer in China. He's like the Cape Middleton of tourism. Wherever he goes, sells out. Valentine's Day. All right, so at this point, I'm gonna sneak in some Valentine's Day etiquette tips for all those of you who are wondering, at what point is it appropriate to go out on a formal Valentine's Day date? If you've been dating for two weeks, is it appropriate or is it too soon? I would say if you just recently started dating and Valentine's Day is like right around the corner, don't put that pressure on yourself. I would say if you just recently started dating and the relationship feels too young for a full on formal Valentine's Day feast that we just give a lot of pressure. Um, just get a bottle of wine and share it at home. Something light and fun and that acknowledges the festival, but doesn't go too overboard. My own personal experience with Valentine's Day is that it is a hallmark holiday where it's really difficult to book restaurants, especially in big cities like New York. And it's at super inflated prices and the food is never even that good. And it's not a holiday, so everybody's kind of rushing to get to the restaurant on time after work. It's just all in all a stressful day with very high expectations. And life is all about expectations. Now, the biggest difference between China and the US is that China does this six times. That's right. We celebrate some version of Valentine's Day on six different days out of a year. I do feel my heart goes out to the men here. So the first Valentine's Day is the American Valentine's Day on February 14th. It's called Qing Ren Jie, and it's been really trendy now amongst rich and young Chinese. On Valentine's Day in 2014, top celebrity Angela Baby received a 300,000 US dollar Lamborghini from her husband, who's also a top celebrity, Wang Xiaoming. Not bad. Let's not forget that Hallmark kind of helped commercialize Valentine's Day into what it is today. According to the Greeting Card Association and Hallmark, 145 million Valentine's Day cards are exchanged a year. The second one that we celebrate is August 25th. It's called Qixi Jie, Qixi Festival. So Qixi is our own traditional love festival that is on falls on the seventh day of the seventh lunar month. That's right. We in China go by the lunar calendar, um, which is about a month off from the Western calendar. But it's basically, Qixi is basically sometime in late August. Qixi is based on a legend about two lovers. One was a cow herder. The other one was a fairy and they were separated by a jealous God who created the Milky Way to separate them. And the two of them could only meet on the night of Qixi. And thus Qixi then became a love holiday. So February 14th and Qixi Jie are kind of the more traditional love festivals where there's the expectation of dinner and flowers and a gift. And the following four are a little bit less conventional. The third one is March 14th and it's called Bai Se Qing Ren Jie, which is kind of like White Valentine's Day. Um, it's a bit quieter. I've never celebrated it. I've just heard of it. So, but it's there. The fourth one falls on May 20th. Um, which we call Wu Arlin, because May is five, which is Wu. Uh, two zero is Arlin, so it's 20, so Wu Arlin. And it's supposed to sound like I love you. Anyway, it came from this pop song and now has also been commercialized uh, and is another excuse for e commerce and brands to push products. But you know, there is a bit of fuss on Wu Arlin. A lot of people send social media stuff on it. The fifth love festival is Lantern Festival, which we call Yuan Xiao Jie. And this falls on the 15th day of the lunar year. So this is a traditional holiday that's rooted in mythology, but it was practiced up until the Qing Dynasty. Lantern Festival is the only day that young girls from good family backgrounds could leave their home unsupervised. And then, so they would use this as an excuse, then go mingle and meet other young guys. Um, and so this is considered date night. Now the sixth one, yes, this means six in Chinese sign language. Uh, the sixth love festival is Singles Day, and this is November 11th. And in Mandarin, we call it Shuang Shi Yi, so double 11, because it's 11 11. Um, and this day is all about loving yourself. 
So Alibaba actually took a page out of Hallmark's book when it launched the first Singles Day shopping event back in 2009, a decade ago now. Um, and it was really just about massive sales discounts on a lot of products. And Alibaba's current CEO, Daniel Jang, is the one who thought of and masterminded Singles Day, which is really about embracing singlehood and loving yourself. This year in 2020, Alibaba platform alone sold 75 billion of product of which 5.4 billion were US goods. Looks like the trade war between US and China hasn't stopped Chinese consumers from wanting to buy American goods. Somebody asked me what my boyfriend does for each of these six festivals. And to be honest, I don't think he's aware of five of them. Last but not least, Halloween. Halloween originated in Europe, but in the 19th century, immigrants brought it to North America where it became popular and spread and evolved in many ways. According to tradition, spirits of the dead were able to come back to life and harm people and crops in the physical world. People tried to appease the rest of spirits and this led to many of today's Halloween traditions. For example, people used to wear costumes of monsters, devils, and ghosts to scare away these evil spirits. In China, Western Halloween is kind of a non-event for most Chinese. The few young ones that do celebrate it are mostly girls, so it's an excuse for them to wear sexy outfits. But Chinese men don't like to do costumes, so it's really just the girls. But in fact, we do have our own versions of ghost theme festivals in China, and they are called Ghost the Ghost Festival, Guijie, the Feast of the Hungry Ghost Festival, and Yanxiao Festival. And they're all about celebrating the spirits of family members that have passed away and moved on to the next world. So Chinese believe that during this month, which they're really in the month of August, that the gates of hell are opened and the spirits roam the physical world. And they're also in search of food. So generally what we do is we offer joss sticks, incense, and we'll prepare food. Let's say, you know, maybe their favorite bowl of wonton noodles, their peking duck, um, and basic essentials really. The main purpose is to welcome them and satisfy their spiritual hunger. Now let's take a look at the differences. During Halloween, Americans dress up like celebrities, children's show characters, superheroes. It's all about getting full professional makeup and that incredible costume to really look the part. I celebrated Halloween with some expat friends in Shanghai this year, and check this out. This was David Culver, who is CNN's Beijing correspondent, uh, and he was RBG, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. I mean, it's amazing. He spent all day getting his makeup done, and he looks like RBG. There was also another one, which was my favorite, and that's Tiger King. Now in China, during all ghost festivals, um, you don't, people don't really dress up as ghosts, although sometimes people who are performing will wear some kind of like ghostly ghoulish mask. Um, but in general, you know, we avoid, during all ghost festival, we avoid wearing all red, all black, or all white. The colors red and black are actually considered inauspicious during ghost festival because those are the colors that attract ghosts. And the same is said of dark colored nail polish. Women are also advised to stick to flats because wearing high heels will make your ankle exposed, which also makes you more vulnerable to being possessed by spirits, especially if you have sexy ankles. Two, trick-or-treating. So after dressing up, kids will go trick-or-treating around the neighborhood. Uh, they'll go to you knock on each door and say trick-or-treat. And if they're not given a treat, then by tradition, they can play a trick on the homeowner. To the Chinese, Halloween is one huge decoration party. You'll only really find Halloween parties in first two cities, so that's like Beijing, Shanghai, Shenzhen, Guangzhou, where there are more expats living. Rich young locals don't really dress up for it because we don't really like costume that much, unless we have kids, in which case, you know, we're always finding things for kids to do, in which case the whole Chinese family will dress up and bring the kid out to go trick-or-treating and usually will stay within the, um, the, the high-end residential compound and the management service is usually the one that organizes everything. So like I said, not that many Chinese, um, even celebs or rich and famous will wear a costume. But what we will do is we will post selfies of ourselves on Chinese social media using Halloween filters. So over here, you can see some celebs that have done that. We have Angela Baby again. And then next we have Gu Li Na Jia. And then we have Yang Mi uh, adding a filter. And then over here we have Chris, who's Wei Fan, one of the hottest male celebs in China and then Zhang Yixing. During the local Chinese ghost festival, however, Chinese people avoid staying out too late. Instead of asking for treats, trick or treat, we give treats to the dead. 
and uh, mostly simple provisional ones such as currency, gold ingots, simple jewelry, favorite food, clothing, incense. Gifts are designed and made of paper representing objects that the spirits may have had when they were still alive um, to let them feel comfortable. So maybe it's their favorite bowl of wonton noodles or maybe it's the race car that they had but it's in paper form and then we burn it and send it off. For us Chinese, we feel that we need to satisfy the ghosts in order to get good fortune. All right, guys, what are your favorite holidays? And tell me how you would like to celebrate it. Would you like to celebrate like a Western person or like a Chinese person? Drop a note in the comments below and don't forget to hit like and subscribe for that next video next week. Bye. Don't forget to like, comment and subscribe. I'll be posting a new video each week who have tips and tricks that I think will help all of us lead a better life.